letting the audience know. Uh, Mark and I actually met at the Behavior Panel Live event, uh, which is was a phenomenal event a couple of months ago. But I've been following your content and that of the Behavior Panel for, I want to say, about a year. Um, it's probably one of the things that my friends think I'm the nerdiest for because uh, it goes really deep on a very specific part of communication, which is the more the behavior aspect, the, a lot of body language that you guys break down. But you do, you are expert in and you do a lot more than analyze body language. So could you give our audience a little bit of background on who you are and what you do? Yeah. So look, here's, here's what I say. I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. And I help people all over the world to stand out, to win trust and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. So what that really means, John, is that I'm kind of using... Uh, body language and behavior as a kind of a hook into this whole world of human communication, which certainly in, in the world that I work in most, which is the business world and the world of politics, institutions, it gets really messy. There's a lot of trouble and therefore there's a lot of value for people if they can get help around that area and really fast help. And so what I would say I do, John, is bring really fast quick, um, uh, effective help in those areas if the trouble is valuable, en valuable enough. If it's, if it's not valuable trouble, get somebody <laughs> else or, or, or find, a, find more, a more valuable problem to deal with, you know? I love that. But by the way, for those of you listening, go back and listen to that. I guess it's several uh, sentences that Mark says. That's kind of your, your tagline I've heard over mm -hmm. and over again. I have listened to that and broken it down and tried to use that as a model to craft my own. And for those of you who have not tried to do it, it's a lot harder than it seems to say a lot in a little very effectively without leaving out any of the important stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's one of the biggest th brevity and being concise is one of the things that I, is one of my opportunities for improvement. Uh, for sure that I work on all the time. Yeah. I mean, look, John, I'm not saying you couldn't come up with that kind of intro fast but it took me years <laughs> to, yeah to bring together that kind of what i would say is a piece of poetry uh, and yeah go i think it's a great idea john go back break that down and try and work out what is it exactly that i'm doing in that introduction and why am i laying down those words same words every yep. time yeah so a few things to me that are very obvious about it is it talks about the problems you solve and who you serve yeah right so those are those are a couple of keys that stick out um, so you mentioned a few things already that I'd, I'd like to get a little bit more context on, uh, which is that you're you're from the UK. You live in Canada now. Yeah. I met you in the US. You work all over the world. Yeah. What brought you from England to Canada? And then how did you sort of get start getting uh, more exposure more to a broader international audience? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm married to Tracy, who's a co-author of truth and lies and um and canadian so it made things it made canada a, a simpler opportunity it's still difficult to emigrate to canada it's still you know if you meet anybody who's emigrated to canada shaken by the hand because they've, they've, they it's not easy okay it's not easy yeah. anybody who thinks ah oh, immigrants like they're in they're out it's like it's, oh, it's really hard I'm really smart and it's really hard to do. Okay. So, so, but it made it just that little bit more easy uh, for me potentially. And things were changing in the UK. We were having our first children. We had, um, we had a place over here already that we bought kind of as an investment years and years ago. And so, you know, it was an opportunity to, to explore, try out a new country for me anyway. And, and it turned out really well. I hit, Canada and certainly Toronto at a at a really good time. It was nothing when I came and got a whole lot better. So oh, that must uh, have been Canada, a long time. Canada, you know, it, it's it's ranking in the world um, went up. I started working in politics here, so I hit politics here at a good time. Banking here at a really good time, um, and just innovation as well. We got some incredible companies now in Canada. So a great place to be. Yeah, it's, it's what. 
that's one of the cities actually that I've not been to that I'd like to get to. The only place in Canada I've been, I don't know if you would even have heard of it, Swan River, Manitoba. I've, I've heard the, of Manitoba, but not, not Swan River. In so. the middle of nowhere. One of my uncles yeah. married a Canadian woman many years ago. Uh, I got to go on a summer trip up there with them. It's it's farm country is what, at least when I was in high school, it was. Yeah. I imagine it still is. It's kind of out in the uh, the frozen tundra. <laughs> A lot of yeah, and no, nothing will have changed uh, there, including the frozen tundra will still be fairly frozen tundra. Yeah, that's my one reservation about when I visit anywhere in Canada. I grew up in South Florida. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned immigration. My mother was born and raised in Panama. Right. Wow. So she she immigrated here. She married my father, who was a U.S. service member. Um, and But still, even with that, back in the day, it was very, very difficult for her to get her. Yeah, hard work. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Um, so you've, you've mentioned a few things also that, that kind of triggered some things that I've consumed a variety of different content that you have put out and something that jumped out at me very quickly was you do a lot of collaborations. Mm. Like I, I mentioned the behavior panel, you, know, you collaborate with three other guys on that, um, that presentation, presentation genius course yeah. is phenomenal, uh, I'm curious about how you met and came to collaborate with Michael Bungay State Steiner. I, am I saying Stanier. that correct? Michael Stan- Bungay Steiner. Yeah, yeah. And then the Michael Lecky uh, collaboration. I was I was watching something with that, and I started to realize you're doing a lot of these collaborations. Tell me, how do you how do you find people that you want to collaborate with, and what are some of the things that you look for? In collaboration partners. Yeah. So I, I, in terms of collaborations, I really only look for one thing, which is people who don't have what I have. <laughs> it's, it's no, yep. you know, I'm looking for a whole different, not a whole different skill set per, particularly, though that could be interesting as well, but a, a different background, outlook, a different way of looking at things, certainly a confidence around those models of looking at things, a confidence around that so that so that we can have kind of real conversations about the way stuff works. There's no good in me collaborating with somebody where I go, well, I'm not I'm not sure about your model there. I mean, I think and and they go, oh, OK, well, then, you know, what do you want? So I, I want to have I want to I want to be tested. And, and I want somebody who wants to be tested alongside that. I want to have real conversations about what I'm fascinated about and therefore get to the much better work. That always happens with Michael Bungay Stania. I mean, arguably the, the, one of the greatest coaches in the world, you know, and, and created models on coaching, which I use every day, patterns of linguistic patterns that I use every day in my coaching, which never fail. Even you are sitting there and you're going, this sure, it surely can't be this simple to change somebody's life. (laughs) And you, (laughs) and you, you play out the patterns and you trust them and you go, wow, look, it's happening right, right in front of me right now. And so Michael and I met years ago, one of the first people that I met in, in uh, Toronto. He's from Australia originally, had worked in, in the US, worked in London. We actually found that he, he lived very close to, to my wife, you know, really early on. We'd have passed each other in the, in the streets, uh, but probably never noticed each other at that point. Though why I wouldn't have noticed him, I don't know, because he's an incredibly tall uh, Australian guy um, and, and, and usually dresses fairly uh, elegantly. Um, so so, um, uh, so we, we met at at some networking and kind of, he was new to the country, to Canada. I was new. We kind of clung to each other a little bit and went, let's find out what each other are about. We then ended up working with Michael Leckie, who was uh, running um, a, an area of Gartner research and especially looking after oh. their training for their, um, uh, well, let's just call them, they were doing coach. We were trying to help them do more coach-like work with their okay. clients, essentially, and help their communication skills. So we worked for years together with Michael Leckie, traveled all over the world together with Michael Leckie and his group as well, training some of the most incredible uh, CIO advisors uh, in the world at the time. 
and developing our work together. So Michael and I, I think it's fair to say that some of our work was being developed at the same time. And so he uses, you know, a lot of the work that I was developing and I use a lot of the work that he was developing as well. I hope that makes yeah, sense. So, so Gartner Research for so most of my audience when I do training is accounting and finance professionals. Right. So Gartner right. Research is pretty top of mind. Totally. For that audience, they're they're pretty familiar with the magic quadrant and yeah, yeah. lots of the research that they put out. So yeah, yeah. Well, so you can imagine there's some some minds in Gartner Research which are quite extraordinary, and we were not helping those people um, have better relationships with their clients and and change those clients' minds. Um, and and so that's a tough that's the tough audience i think that's gartner research that's a tough audience you know and so you've got to be absolutely on your game and your models and your techniques and your tools and your strategies have to be totally on point you cannot mess around with that yep. that audience and i think it's fair to say and, and many of them would back us up on this that we completely transformed some of their thinking about how to do the work that they were doing on that. It was an incredible time. And so, you know, I thank Michael Leckie and I thank Gartner and I thank uh, Michael Bungistania for having me around for that. It was an extraordinary time. Well, I think what's going on in that community with accounting and finance professionals, it's, I feel a lot better today about it than I did 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago is about when I got into the trading end of things. And I felt like every time I was trying to get anyone who asked me to speak to let me speak about communication skills, it was always, well, could you do something on Excel or budgeting or modeling, you know, financial modeling? And I, well, yeah, I could do all that. I did that for 20 years for big companies, but I want to specifically focus on communication because it was a weak area for me. And when I did the work and got better at it, it showed in my career trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a huge difference in me getting projects that on paper, I probably was not the best candidate for. Um, and I still, to this day, remember a guy at my first job out of college, somehow word leaked out that I was, I was looking at this other job in mergers and acquisitions, which at the time I just thought sounded cool. And somehow or the other, he got word of it. And he said, Sanchez, why are you even applying for that? You don't know anything about it. You have no chance. I ended up getting the job and learning a lot. And what I found out later on about why they chose me out of the, the people they interviewed, it was the communication skills. Yeah. Um, and so I've always, even since 20 plus years ago, I've always felt like that's such a big part of anybody's uh, toolkit. And for some reason, accounting and finance professionals focus very little of their time and prof professional development on it. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, John, I mean, we've got to accept that for anybody in a, in a, in accounting and business, they, their their technical skills must be at a certain level. There's some like there's some bad mistakes that you can make, that are gonna, you know, going to cause a lot of trouble. But at some point, that tops out. At some point, it's like yeah. okay, so we got a whole bunch of people that can achieve this at a technical level. Yeah, then might be now okay. How can you think about it more creatively? That's an area you maybe want to think about. But then it's like, well, can you put a team together? Can you lead people through a project? Can you lead people who aren't part of your group normally through a project? That's when the real complexity starts. Because I, I, I know accounting can be complicated, but it's, I don't think it's ever particularly complex. You know, and you, and you might argue with me on, on that and that would be that would be fair but complicated is putting a man on the moon okay that's that's just complicated that's just algorithms okay and you, you get them wrong and the man doesn't go to the moon and and you know you know it doesn't come back okay you miss the, you miss the windrow of entry it's critical okay um complex involves involves different things happening each day like what that person was like yesterday is not what they were like today so, so the way you are managing the situation yesterday is not how you're going to manage it today. And you need to be adaptable. You need many, many models to be able to work with. You need many, many techniques. And you need to have an understanding of yourself so you know how you're going to react to that complexity because you are part of that complex system that's, that's going on. So, you know, anybody out there who is listening to this, watching this right now, 
and you're thinking, you know, how do I move along my career? How do I how do I be trusted with bigger pieces, more important pieces of work? I guarantee you, it's going to be your communication that's going to get you that kick at the can. First of all, yeah. So you use the word that every time I bring it up, I feel like I have to be very clear about what I mean by creativity. Yeah. Uh, because especially in accounting, a lot of the people who are very creative in accounting are the ones that end up in jail. But but there are many, many areas within the communication process of communicating all this information about numbers where creativity can make it a lot easier for the person receiving that communication. Um, but it's funny, it's almost like a buzzword that, that people want to stay away from in accounting creativity because it implies we refer to it as Betty Crocker accounting, right? Cooking the books. That, <laughs> those are the creative types that we don't want in right, accounting. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's not the way I'm thinking about creativity in <laughs> accounting. You know, I've, I've got friends in accounting who have created new products. I mean, created yeah. new channels to work through, create, you know, again, are trusted with more within an organization because they have the ability to think differently but of course, still within the confines of the legal system that's right. <laughs> that's going on there, you know. Another word you mentioned that's a, a big one, especially for me, it was kind of my awakening. You talked about awareness. Um, can you talk about the importance of awareness in the context of you work with a lot of business people? What are some of the things that people can proactively do to improve their awareness around how they're communicating with other people? So that was a big blind spot for me that I had to have pointed out by someone else. Yeah. So look, I would, I would do this, um, to improve your awareness of other people, ask them more questions, be more direct with them about what's going on, how they're thinking and how they're feeling. Now, um, what might that sound like? Uh, say I'm there presenting in front of you, you, John and, and, and your business leader there with your team. And I got a new idea for you and your organization and, you know, skilled in body language reading as I might be, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, what is John thinking about this? What is his team thinking about this? Where am I in this process right now of moving them towards using this idea that I've got for them? So all I do is I stop what I'm saying and go and I go, John, I just want to check in with you and the team. You know, what have you heard so far that you're most excited about? You know, now that question has put you in a corner. Okay. Cause I didn't ask you, is anything exciting? I didn't even ask you, are you listening? Yes. I was, yeah. I said, what have you heard that's most exciting for you? So it says, it says you've heard a lot. Okay. It says there's been a lot of exciting stuff. And I want you now to put it in a hierarchy and now tell me the most exciting thing. Now, constantly the brain will comply to that and you'll go, okay, well, here's what I like most about this, or here's what I'm most excited. You will create some kind of hierarchy. That's an important piece of feedback for me. Okay. Because, yeah. because let's just say you are the leader of that team. Okay. There's going to be a certain amount of compliance around you and your viewpoints okay so i can see what you're saying back to me i can watch the team you know see whether they seem to be in agreement non-verbally or not and then i can start talking some more based on that i can ask you a question i can go okay so i see that you're really excited about this area you know out of area a b and c where would you best like to go next what seems most important for you that we should talk about next. So I'm trying to use what I might call, you know, an interview or interrogation technique of sorts in order to get out your value hierarchy and see where I should communicate next. But in a sense, it's very open mind reading that I'm doing because I'm basically saying, tell me what's going on in your head under, a, un, under some criteria that I'm going right. to close down around you. Does that, does that make sense, John? It does. And the way you explained it actually, I think, is one of the reasons when I first saw you on the behavior panel and, and all the guys on the panel do this, what you did in that answer is you didn't just give me an answer and stop there. You explained enough of it so that I understand the whys and the wherefores of each piece of that question. So similar to what we were saying about your intro yes. statement, 
when I understand the pieces of it now, I can feel a lot more comfortable going back and saying, okay, I don't have to memorize the words. No. I get the concepts. I understand what's going on there and the structure of it. So that allows me now, if I want to use that same tactic, I can use whatever words are comfortable that fit me, that feel like me, but still use that framework and know that every time there's some effectiveness built into it because this is a proven framework. Yeah, so it's exactly yeah. that. It's a structure. It's a yeah. piece of architecture. I don't know what bricks or bamboo or mud or steel you're going to you're going to create that piece of architecture in it'll take anything it'll take any words any language it doesn't care about that but the structure is really specific and the structure works on human beings because you as a human being just like anybody watching or listening to this your brain likes to do hierarchy it responds to the idea of hierarchy it part of it is designed simply around <laughs> let's work out what is what is best in a category Okay, imagine imagine having a brain, John, that, that couldn't work out for itself what it believed was best in any one category. You know, if I would say to you, well, what's your, what's the, uh, you, let's just say you weren't feeling very well, okay? And I said to you, John, well, what, what would be the best food for you right now? What if it, it just went, I don't know, well, you're gonna die. <laughs> you know, if you can't work out the best, you're gonna die. <laughs> you know, or you stand more chance of it, you know? Yeah, well, I'm sure you're familiar with, is it uh, Damasio that did that study on the, the gentleman who had a brain injury and his emotion center got damaged? Right. And with what they found out over a, a series of different experiments that they did in observations, he actually, his life went to crap because he literally couldn't make decisions without being able to use his emotion. Something as simple as, should I use this pen or that pen? Right. And it would take forever to make these little decisions. Right, uh, right. Meanwhile, he's yeah. being eaten alive by a tiger. It's like, well, should I yeah. defend myself or not? <laughs> should I Should I run or should I hide? Should I, no, you need, you need quick emotional, you need best guess thinking, which is, yeah. you know, part of what the brain does best guess thinking but there's parts of it that guess quicker than others so our what we my, people might say you know our logical mind it's still best guessing it just will take longer about it and 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 allow you to think about more data around that okay our emotional brain is still doing best guess but it does it on a on a whole bunch of different criteria that it can crunch really fast without you noticing that that data crunching going on. Yeah. So I'm curious. I'd love to get your thoughts on what, when I first started speaking and doing training. I felt the need to have everything structured, yeah. to essentially have everything memorized. And now I'm kind of leaning towards the other end of things where there, there's less memorization and more just, I want to have a structure, but now that I've got more experience, I don't feel like I need to memorize anything. I just kind of have an outline to keep me on task to make sure that I'm delivering on the points that I was hired to deliver on. And something I notice about the way you present, I don't think I picked up on it until I consumed a fair amount of your content because in the beginning, it seems very improvisational mm -hmm. when, I, when I first started watching your stuff. And then as I started to learn more about what you were talking about, I started then recognizing, oh, you do have structure to all this stuff. You're just much more casual in, in your presentation. The way you speak feels more like you and I having a conversation like we are now more than, yeah. okay, I'm standing in front of you. I'm giving a presentation and it's, and it's very structured. How, how much do you actually have prepared when you're going to do a talk or a training versus just saying, okay, I'm going to hit these three topics. That's all I need to know. And when I show up, I'll judge based on the audience and a few questions where I go with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, here, so number one, the preparation is a, is a lifetime of, of just information and working with other people and just caring about the content and caring about about having the best stuff for the for the outcomes that people need so you and and you cannot gloss over that okay you you, you know anybody out there who's looking to be a trainer themselves you, you got to put the work in 
Okay, you've got to put, put the work in around that. And you've got to study yeah. with everybody and consume everything you can so that you then have a very solid idea of, I know a lot of stuff and I'm confident with a lot of stuff and it's good stuff. I know the good stuff and the bad stuff and I want to, I want to just deliver the good stuff. Now, then at that point, here's what I'm doing. I'm going, what is the outcome that we need here? You know, what, what do we want to achieve here? And I might even check in with the audience on that and go, hey, I think the outcome is this. Am I right? Do we, am I right saying we have this problem? Am I right saying we haven't managed to fix that problem right now? And if we fixed it today, that would be of benefit. Okay, let's fix it right now. <laughs> and, so, and so now I'm into what can I deliver that will best help everybody right now fix this thing and i'm going to keep checking in and going are we getting a fix are we getting are we, are we finding this helpful and then and 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 that's going to help me now even if somebody goes yeah, yeah i don't know whether this is helpful there's some stuff that i know is helpful and i'll go yeah i know i understand it doesn't feel helpful right now does it uh, bear with me <laughs> you know or i might go or i might go okay great well let me just go to the most helpful stuff okay I'm going to give exactly the same stuff as I was going to give because I know it's helpful. <laughs> it's like I've seen enough human beings in my time to know the resistance that comes to help. Yeah. And, and to be okay about lying to the audience and going, okay, <laughs> I will, I will switch tax. Let's talk about what you want to talk about. Yeah. I'll make them think that's happening because I know what's going to best, best help them. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of tools there that I'm using to influence and persuade and help people. Uh, but ultimately, I'm trying to keep it as fluid as possible. So it, so it is, as much as it can be, a real conversation between me and the one or the many that are out there who have, who have said, okay, yes, give me some help on, on yeah. this. So it does. It does feel very much like, like this feels. Yeah, it's uh, just a, like the a conversation. It's like yeah. a conversation, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's where when I started, and this leads into another question that I have about the the deep expertise. Mm. It's it's one of the things that I realized. Again, it it gets to these blind spots that we could sometimes have, right? Until you see someone who's at another level from yourself, you're never quite sure how good you are. And I think that's where the last year or two, I've started to discover some of the people who are at the top of the game, someone who's, mm-hmm. you know, rated like the number one, uh, what, what was it? The, the award or the uh, body language uh, body language. in the world, number yeah. one body language expert yeah. in the world. Right. So when you're listening to someone who is that expert, you start to realize that like people, people like to say there are levels to these things. Right. And it's kind of scary when you've been doing something for a while and then you meet somebody that's at a level where you go, I feel like I'm at the kiddie table. Mm-hmm. But what have I been doing with the past 10 years? Why don't I know some of these things? The, the only thing that gives me solace is when some of you guys have talked about how so many people that are considered experts still don't really understand some of these niches in areas of body language and other, other areas. So who are some of the mentors that you've had that have got you to this level of expertise that you're at now? Yeah, so it's always been the people that I've worked with. Um, and so I guess if I were to turn that question into some kind of help for people, if you're there thinking, well, I want to be really good in a certain area. I want to be, I really be like good. you when I grow up. Yeah, I want to be like <laughs> you. I want to I I be really good in a certain area. Yes, there is a certain amount of study you can do. But in the end, you've got to go and work alongside those people. That's that's where you'll really understand the the economy of what they're doing. Because look, you know, I I got got four books and 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 I would think and I would. And so you could trawl through my books and 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 that still wouldn't help you understand what it is that I'm really doing that might make me, you know, ranked in that expert area, because it's all the stuff that I'm not paying attention to. That's, that's, it's, it's, it's it's the hierarchical system. It's going, look, you could pay attention to all of the stuff, you know, in, in, in all of these, these books, 
but here's what matters most. And so here's what I'm focusing on every time I'm working. And then it would be about being with me during that time and, and seeing the stresses and the pressures and seeing the things that I'm trying to get done and noticing, oh, I'm sticking with my model. Like, don't pay attention to anything else. Just pay attention to this thing here, this thing here. That's the thing that matters most. Now, what I want you to know about that is, is I'm using my models in order to get the job done, okay? You've got to learn my models and you've got to apply those models. But, it, but if, you're, if you really use me well as a mentor, you'll come up with your own models. And then you'll come to me with your model and you'll go, Mark, here's what I've noticed. You know, I think you should be paying more attention to X because it actually gets you a better result. And I'll go, you're wrong. Right? <laughs> you're just wrong. Yeah. And then you'll go, well, no, I'm right because I've done it and it gets me a good result. And I'll go, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in your model. I do my model and I'm going to stick to my model and you will never change my mind. Okay. And you're going to find out that I'm not the mentor for you anymore. Yeah. And we'll break up. And so, and so that's, that's what you've got to understand is going to happen from my point of view in any mentorship situation is you should be getting yourself to the point where, um, you know, in those Jungian terms, you, you, you kill the father, which is whatever yeah. structure I have created to say, this is the structure that works whether you like it or not or know it or not you you should be working towards killing my structure in order to be yeah. born out of that a new structure that works for you yeah that you can bring to other people if you want to be like me yeah, yeah this... if you want to be like me you got to work on not being like me but first of all you have to work on being like me so that that reminds me of a realization that I made years ago when I was thinking of changing careers, I was looking into PhD programs mm -hmm. and started to realize that it seemed pretty consistent that all the PhD programs I was looking into, as soon as you finished your PhD, they wanted, they did not want you to teach at their institution. They wanted you to go away. You could come yeah. back at a later time, but they wanted you to go away, take what you've learned, go out of the world and see how things are done in other places. Kind of like you're saying here, like, Check out how our model compares to all those other models. Because at the end of the day, PhD's sort of aim, aim in life is to push the body of knowledge of whatever yes. the thing is that they're expert in. And so if they're just constantly parroting the same old models, they're just marketing. Yeah, it's right? not they're just, reproduction. It's evolution yeah. we're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yep. that's, you know, and that's why universities, good universities are so important because they should be questioning absolutely everything and looking yeah. for pushback and evolution and then throwing people out and going, right, take that new idea out there, test it in the real world, see how it survives, find a niche for it, you know? Something else that you do that, I think sometimes you you pointed out less than some of the other guys on the behavior panel, but it's still there underpinning what you're teaching, which is that it's it's based in science and lots and lots of real world experience. This isn't just, hey, I'm Mark. I've tried this a couple of times and it worked for me. <laughs> yeah. Give it a try. It might work for you, right? Which I hear a lot out there. Somebody will be teaching something. Somebody will try it. It doesn't work. And they go, well, it worked for me. I don't know what to tell you. Right. Yeah. I, I think a lot of what you didn't say was there's actually a lot of experience and a lot of research behind the stuff that you teach. You just don't necessarily stop every time. Like Chase Hughes is, is really good about doing this. He'll cite the exact study and who, who it was that created the theory of the model and all that stuff. You don't necessarily cite it, but it's still there underneath the stuff that you're teaching. Yeah, look, I, I'm not going to teach anybody anything that I don't know works brilliantly and economically and every time. Yeah. Okay. Because that's just not helpful. It's just not helpful. And there are some people out there who go, hey, you know, try this out. It worked for me. So, I, okay, I don't like your data point on that. Just I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to risk my life on that. You know, yeah. and, and I have clients who are in really harsh situations, tricky situations, 
where bad things are going to happen if this goes wrong. So we, we, you know, they're not paying me to to gamble. They're paying yeah. me to <laughs> give them better, way way better probabilities of success. So you just said on another thing that I I want our audience to get out of this. Um, whenever somebody hears me talk about any of the other guys on the panel, and I mentioned that they come from a, a military interrogator background, they immediately go, "Well." What does that have to do with what I do? I work in business, mm -hmm. right? You talk a little bit more about the business context of things, although all of you work in, in, with big businesses as well. Um, but can you help our audience understand when you're working with people solving these problems, what are some of the types of problems that are the most common things that you're helping people with? The complexity of human inter interactions. <laughs> At where, where there is massive value ascribed to the outcome. Yeah. And so I don't want to, you know, I look, I could throw out dollar values and that would be shocking to some people and other people would go, what, only half a billion? I'm dealing with, you know, ex, you know three billion dollar deals. Okay, fine. So, so let's not bother about that. And sometimes it's human life that's that's at risk and sometimes it's one human life and it's or it's multiple human lives sometimes it's the way a country is viewed by other countries sometimes it's the way the leader of of a large organization or even a small organization there's no look value is 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 situational you know uh, what what is of most importance in your life john right now somebody else could look at it and go it's just inconsequential but to you it isn't and we might look at a three billion dollar deal and somebody else would go it's inconsequential i'm trying to stop a country getting invaded right now so so who yeah. you know currency means means nothing to me right now so so i'm i'm dealing with the things that people feel are most valuable because if they can't ascribe i don't want to try and help with a problem where they go well it'd be nice if we could fix that it's like don't yeah. bother with this don't like what are you why am i there for nice yeah, I, nice to have I, rarely get acted on no it's just fruitless it's like i'll come up with a great solution and they'll go yeah well we'll put that on the top shelf and we'll think about doing that i need people going out and going we've got to action this right now to test is it going to work you know or, so, so look, I don't know whether that helps <clears throat> helps that question, but but understand that's where my my work sits best, and that's where the passion is 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 for fixing real problems. And sometimes, you know, you can be with a client and go, you don't have a you don't have a real problem right now. Like, let's let's stop yeah. this, <laughs> or you so, or you or be honest with me. And and so, you know, I can push them and push them and push them. To, to or I might say, are you happy for me to push you now for what the real issue is, and interrogate you for the real issue, and so they might go, yeah, okay, and we'll get there, or they might go, no, not really. It's just like, okay, well, if you if you don't if you don't want to let yourself into that arena where we're going to find out why you really think I can help, then I can't help. Makes sense. So. We've only got a few minutes left and I want to kind of give a little bit more context to our audience on not necessarily what's in your books or what you teach, but a little bit more about who Mark Bowden is just as a person. So mm -hmm. if we were to go in the way back machine and we went back to say high school, and you and I are both 15 years old. I'm sure I'm a lot older than you, but let's just say we're both 15 years old and we're in a class together. Who was Mark at 15? What, what wow. were the things that were on your, your, your radar that were important to you? Was it sports? Was it acting all the way back then? Mm. Uh, no, visual art. Visual, visual art was art. the most important thing. Yeah, visual art was the most important thing. Um, acting, uh, though I, you know, worked in, in theater, film, TV for many, many years uh, at, a, at a really high level, not only performing, but directing and creating and, um, you know, some of the strongest story, you know, as part of a film that has been awarded the most Oscars ever. So, so, you know, it, it, big arenas, many, many West End shows. Acting was just something that people said I was good at. And so I went, oh, okay, well, I'll do that then. I'll, I'll pursue that because, because I was just looking for something that people would go, well, you, you seem to be really good at that. It's like, oh, thank goodness. Somebody's found <laughs> something that I'm good at. All right, 
go down that route. But but really, what I was what I was um, just uh, God just obsessed with was visual art, like how pictures work, how pictures move people's minds. How was pictures... it still images or all still all, in... all. all. The, okay. the image, the moving image, the moving picture, the the the, the picture like like. Yeah, we just know we know if we want to if we want to move move a country we'll send a picture <laughs> if, we wanna, if i want to if i want to influence a mass i'm not gonna say anything i'm gonna send pictures to do the job so much more economical than wasting my time with with language yeah sure language can be part of that i'm not going to exclude language but if you got me to pick if you said well you can send words mark or pictures you know uh, i'll go okay i'll take the pictures take the pictures because i'm going to win you know if they send words and i send pictures i'm winning it's all over yeah Yeah. it's all over like i'm destroy them with my pictures so so that's that's what i was obsessed with and so if you were sitting next to me in in class at 15 i was the um 15 16 i was the only person in my school who was taking art at a a higher level um i was you, you know unique in in my year of of being obsessed in that area yeah so that to me that that context helps connect some dots because the body language a lot of what you talk about is all that that visual obviously with a lot of explanation and structure Mm -hmm. uh, and the models behind it Um, so what did you want to be when you grew up grew up back then did you want to be a filmmaker or it sounds like the acting was just, it wasn't necessarily obsessed with acting. You were good at it, but did you yeah. have an aspiration back then? Well, right, right back, I wanted to be a visual artist. I wanted to be a printmaker. There was nothing better than sitting down with a piece of warm lino and cutting it into something <laughs> and then printing off some stuff, you know, and putting it up and people going, wow, God, you did, that's really good. You know, but but when I was doing, it, it, I was, I was kind of quite, isolated and the, and the people around me though good teachers and a uh, good audience there was nobody being very vocal about you're really good at this um and so it but they were about performing and acting and so and so i kind of went down that route rather than rather than just the street and there's no problem with that like it turned out well because because theater film tv is just moving pictures that's all it is yes yeah. <laughs> just moving images that's at its real heart. And so that's what I went into was creating um, the, the, the area of visual theater, which revolutionized theater across the world. What we were doing in the late eighties, early nineties, blasted theater. I mean, it just destroyed the old school of, of theater completely and made, made all the stuff that you watch right now in theater that you go, this is fantastic. You know, Lion King, anything that you just go, why, you know, that that I know it's not a giraffe, but it, I, th- I think it's a giraffe. <laughs> I know it's I know it's people just moving stuff, sticks and stuff. But it, but I'm conned, I'm conned, and I love it. That's what we were doing. We were making sure that that stuff could could be brought to a mass audience. Do you still, outside of what you do in the business world, are you still actively involved in that world as well? No, I don't even I don't even want to go. Can't sit there. Can't really you talk it. so passionately about it yeah it seems... but 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 it, it, it's, it's like a passionate mechanic it's like you you sit there you sit there and you go oh what are you doing why are you do no don't do that oh god you've messed up you've you've connected the battery to the wrong end of course it's oh you could have got a much faster engine in that for much taking up a much smaller space it's like why don't you know the mechanics why Does don't it... you know so Does it impede your ability to enjoy watching something? Terrible. I'm terrible to go to the theater with. I'm just a. Oh wow. Okay. A, it's it's not um, it's not um, though. I did go. I was in London a few weeks back, and I did go to with my kids and my wife to the the play that went wrong, play that goes wrong, which was brilliant, just brilliant fast, brilliant fast because it was this... they got the mechanics like like. Like, you know, there was an example of you, you mechanically, you've, you've done it like, well done. 
Yeah, this, my brain works in weird ways, but you're reminding me when I was a kid, my dad was in the army for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And when we would watch military movies, I think it used to drive him bonkers because he would, he would critique it. Like you're talking about, he'd go, no, no, that's not the way that works. (laughs) That's the, that weapon doesn't work. You know, he, all these little things that someone who has that expertise, it just jumps off the screen to them. And the rest of us, we don't even notice it. Right. Because because I want when people go to the especially, you know, when I started working in the theater, you were up against the, the dawn of some of the best TV, best film. And 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 so it's like, why are people going to go out? What, what are you going to do for them that's going to get them out on a into the West End of London on a rainy night to spend money, go to a restaurant and, and then sit and watch this for two and a half hours what are you going to do for them so i'd sit watching this stuff and i'd just go not good enough i not don't do that you're spoiling people's lives (laughs) you take it seriously (laughs) yeah 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 it's like terrible terrible thing to do with do to people (laughs) i guess that must that must be for anyone that gets to that level of expertise that must be a risk that it forever ruins things that just don't get to that that level of quality, you know. Like I'm sure a, a connoisseur foodie would be appalled to go to a McDonald's. Like, no, just oh, I'll just skip was, the meal. Was, I mean, I was a nightmare to be. You know, when I was training people, <laughs> I mean, people would say it's like it's like being directed, trained by Gordon Ramsay. It was just. Ooh. It was. <laughs> I had zero. That brought a vis- That brought a visual yeah, to mind. <laughs> zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for. For uh, you know, n- the, not delivering the highest quality. <laughs> well, there's there was a guy. I don't know if you have ever followed American football, but back in the the '60s, the Green Bay Packers were one of the most winning teams, and their their coach Vince Lombardi was notorious for being meticulous about details and very hard nosed, and. In interviews, a lot of his players said the same one line that resonated with me, which was, I didn't always like playing for him, but boy, I sure did like the winning. Just his his standard was so high. And sometimes the way he said the things that he needed to say, or he felt he needed to say in his coaching, didn't always land the best with some people, but they saw they got results. And so they said, all right, I'm, I'm on board. I want to stay on this team. I want to keep winning. Yeah. Let me ask you one other quick question. We'll oh. wrap it up. Um, so there's a, a huge variety of different things that people could do to improve their communication skills. If you could just give one piece of advice, either the first thing or maybe the most impactful thing that someone could do to start improving their communication skills, regardless of where their skills are today, what one thing could they start with? Uh, think about what's already one thing that's already really worked well for them in communication you know a technique something that they've tried out and it and it worked okay do that way more (laughs) keep on doing that thing way more like try and do it every day whatever it is you think it is try and do that every day several times a day make it just focus 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 on that thing and see whether you get a bigger increment of improvement. So don't try and stop doing anything. Start doing one thing that you are, you are very um, confident is working. Start doing it more and more and more and more and more. Wow, that's a great, great piece of advice, especially for those accounting and finance folks out there who think creativity is a dirty word. It's not a dirty word. When you were saying that, I was thinking creativity. That's something that I've not leaned into enough, I think, because of having it beaten out of me through various jobs in accounting and finance. But I think a lot of people, they get into jobs that may not lead into their strengths. And so that piece of advice, I think anybody could use, regardless of what it is they do for a living, uh, to make a big improvement. Totally. Well, Mark, I thank you very much for your time. And hopefully I could talk to you for hours, but got to respect your time. Maybe again. One, I was going to say one, one day yeah. down the road, we'll, we'll do a part two and, and who knows where the topics may, might take us. Would love, love to. Great. Thanks, Thanks for again for your time. See you guys next time. You know.